of our collective hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are truly our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from the book of Zechariah, and instead of having you all fumble through your Bibles to try and find it real quick, I'm going to ask that you just close your eyes. And, and that you might see if an image will come to uh, your mind. I'm going to read from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. And they read as follows. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious as he. Humble and riding on a donkey or a colt, the fold of a donkey. I cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle uh, bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from the sea to sea, from the rivers to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your captives free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope, today. I declare that I will restore to you double. Amen. Thus ends the reading of the word. Amen. I'm going to try to preach after having to go behind that song. <laughs> Let us consider for a theme what is required to be a prisoner of hope. What is required to be a prisoner of hope? I don't know if you recall, but several weeks ago I told you that I was frustrated with the lectionary because there were so many texts that I wanted to preach. In addition to the Romans passage that I preached that entitled The Futile Attempt to Understand Sin, where Paul says uh, rhetorically, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? There was also that week the Matthew 11 passage where Jesus says conclusively, Come unto me, all ye that labor and a heavy burden, I will give you rest. And then there was the Zechariah text. And this Zechariah text is always one that I've always wanted to preach, and I just said, I'm going to cheat on the lectionary this week. Because I'm going to preach this Zechariah text. It's the killer. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. He is riding a donkey. Those words alone, don't they remind you of a Palm Sunday scene? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the imagery of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey right. to sh a shout of Hosanna? Does that sound like what Zechariah is talking about this morning? But this is a Palm Sunday. Mm. There are no palm branches. Mm. We're not preparing for the excitement and exuberance of Holy Week. All we have is the imagery offered by Zechariah. But beyond the shouts of Hosanna, Palm Sunday reminds us just how fleeting the human condition can be. See, after the shouts of Hosanna, somebody lied on Jesus. After the shouts, somebody denied knowing. After the shouts, somebody became a government informant. After the shot, somebody arrested him. Right. After the shot, somebody beat him. Right. After the shot, somebody mocked him. Right. After the shot, somebody crucified him. Right. See, after the shot, Paul suddenly reminds us that it was a week when Jesus dropped in the opinion polls from Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify and crucify. Oh, my Maybe it was texts like this one in Zechariah and others that caused the crowd to sour on Jesus. Right. Maybe they thought that Jesus didn't do what they thought he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king has come. That sounds, when you think about Palm Sunday, that sounds like the prophecy had been fulfilled. Mm. But the book of Zechariah was written to confront the current circumstance along with the manner that God would adjudicate their suffering. See, the background for this passage uh, is the Babylonian exile, which began in 587 BCE, when Babylonia destroyed Jerusalem and forced the Israelites into exile. Then the Persians, about what, 50 years later, the Persians uh, conquered the Babylonians. And the Persian Emperor Cyrus, Persian Emperor Cyrus said to the Israelites, you can go back home if you want to. Now everybody chose not to go home. Now whether it was out of fear or a desire for stability or worry about how they're going to make it economically. Because the, those who did go back, went back to a battered and beaten city. Mm. Their land had been overrun. They had lost everything. Mm. And like modern day multinational corporations that rob third world countries of their natural resources uh, for profits with absolutely no regard for future considerations, mm. their occupiers seized their land, placing them in mental as well as physical and incarceration for economic and political reasons. Mm. The Israelite refugees returned to a Jerusalem of their present that was a far cry from the Jerusalem of their past, mm. resulting in a crisis of faith. Think about how you used to be and how you are right now. Mm. might be enough to have a crisis mm. of faith. They were not fully restored to their land, but rather allowed to be there under Persian rule. They were denied the most basic impulse known to the human condition, mm. which is to be free. Mm. I don't care where you live, what language you speak, what religion you have, there's not a person on this planet whose natural impulse is not the desire to be free. Mm. Their existence was the antithesis of the words of Thomas Jefferson who said, rightful living is unobstructed action according to our will within the limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. So it's not just being free, but I can't be so free that I put you under my thumb. Come on now. They were political pawns, and the price of returning to their homeland was the unyielding stench of occupation. But Zechariah is saying in the text this morning, they can still be of good cheer. Mm. Your king is coming. And he's going to stop all this fighting and war. You're going to know peace because God is going to make things right. No longer are you going to be prisoners of war and suffering, but rather you will be prisoners of hope. Yeah. Way that they are 
affirm that passage in uh, the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the 5th verse, he said he was pierced for our transgressions, mm. wounded for our iniquities, the punishment on him, and by his stripes mm. we are made whole. I understand why to be a prisoner of hope is not one of the hallmark texts of biblical lore on par with the 23rd Psalm in John 3.16. Mm. And I fail you this morning to examine what is required to be a prisoner of hope mm. in the 21st century. We not only justify the scant use of Zechariah in the homiletic tradition, it risks offering a message that has absolutely no basis for transformation in our lives today. For those living in the 21st century who face absurdity day after day, who may look good on the outside, but troubled on the inside, who may be in dire need of a hope that is superior to the nonsense they're dealing with, who require a joy that calamity cannot eradicate, who want a peace that can push back against the unpredictability of the human condition, who need to be reminded every now and then that the inconvenient love that takes you by the suffering of Calvary is the only road that leads to resurrection and the blessed assurance that seemingly powerless love still remains greater than loveless power. We need to be reminded this morning that we are indeed called to be prisoners of hope. Yes. Now, Zechariah takes two words which are seemingly contradictory in scope, prisoner and hope, and he morphs them into a phrase that illuminates us on how we ought to be a while on this pilgrim journey. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. See, this single verse has been one, you've heard me from time to time say we ought to be prisoners of hope. That's what followers of Jesus if you're going to commit to inconvenient love. But just as you must pass algebra 1 and 2, geometry and trigonometry before you take calculus, right. it will stand the reason that you must be a prisoner of hope before you can possess the courage and the fortitude required to engage in Jesus' inconvenient love. Right. 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 To be a prisoner of hope is to have the love of God barricading your soul. Mm. It is to have the citadel of renewal stand between you and the impending invasion of absurdity. Mm. It is the fortress that allows